good morning. Good morning. Hey, we are glad you're here. We're excited you're here. Uh, this morning I started my, I opened up my U version just for a little devotion time. And the first thing I read said that God wants to do something incredible in you. And so I just want to pass that on because that is so true for us today. God wants to do something incredible in our lives. And in just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity. Uh, Lance and this team are going to lead us in a time of worship. And Pastor Tony's going to come. He's going to open God's word. And we're just going to allow God's spirit to do something incredible in our lives today. And that is our hope. That is our prayer. That we would listen to God. That we would allow God to speak to us today. And that our hearts would be changed as a result uh, of just being here, worshiping together, uh, worshiping with God. And uh, so that is, our, that is our hope today. So I'm going to start by just opening us in a word of prayer. And then uh, the band will uh, lead us from there. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for an opportunity that we have to worship you, Father. Whether it be here in this building or those that are joining us online, we just want to say thank you for allowing us to worship corporately as a body, God. And God, would you do just that? Would you do an incredible work in our hearts today as a result of just connecting with your people, connecting with your spirit, Father God? Would you speak to us today as we worship you in song? Would you speak to us today, uh, Father God, as, as we open your word in, in the book of Philippians? Uh, Father God, again, thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand and worship with the band.
Jesus, let all else fade away. 
Father, we bow our heads, we bow our hearts at this point, God. Uh, as we say, we, we say your presence is all that matters. We say, we ask you, God, to, uh, to look into our hearts, look into our minds. And so, God, I just would ask you in this moment, in these moments, review our hearts right now. Review our minds and help us think through, God. Where have we been at this week? Where, what have we been up to this week? What are the thoughts that we have thought? What are the emotions that we have felt? What are the words that we have said? God, would you review to us, review right now, and, and reveal to us times and moments that maybe fear ruled the day. Maybe there was times when we responded to people with hopelessness instead of hope. We assumed the worst and we thought the worst in the situation. God, look into our relationships and how we acted towards one another. And Were there times this week where we acted with, with ungodly love? Un, with, ungodly, with ungodly anger, God? Were there times that we acted in such a way that... that that we were provoked or we were provoking one another. God, as you remind us of those things, we are reminded that, that those sins, those, those failings, those areas where we have fallen short are paid for and covered over with the blood of Jesus. And so thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your son paying for that. But Lord, my prayer is that you would help us that you would help us continue to apply the gospel into our lives and continue to apply the hope that is ours in you and that you would change us from the inside out. Lord, my prayer is in this moment that we would all just have our, our ears tuned to, the, to your word. And as we open up your word, whether we're in this room or we're online, that we would hear a clear message from you today through through the reading of Scripture, and through its teaching, God. These things we pray in your Son's powerful name. Amen. Hey, I want to add my, my welcome to you. I know Pastor John greeted you and welcomed you to this day, whether you're in this room or you're online watching us from wherever. We're so glad we are together. We are so glad. I am so glad to be able to see you, uh, to experience you, and uh, and it's it's... Good. It's good for us to be together today, worshiping the living God. Uh, you know, for me, myself, it's easy. It's easy in this time, in this season. I confess to you to, to to get frustrated, right? It's easy to experience frustration, and it's easy for me to compare my situation to other people and think, "Oh, I haven't." So bad, right? Or we're in such a difficult spot. I, I'm guessing. I see Sandy shaking her head. I realize I'm not the only one in that in that in the room that deals with that, right? We're all we all find ourselves in those scenarios, and I find myself at times getting so frustrated. There can be moments where I get so frustrated that what I have to do is just stop, right? Just stop and breathe. Breathe and calm down. You know, that's the, the best words we can give ourselves. It, the reality is, is little things in life that can set us off, little things that can cause us to spiral out of control, they are so important for us to pay attention to. The reason being is because, and as we're going to look at today in Philippians chapter 2, the small areas of our lives, the small things that would be easy for us to just Say, just to say, oh, this is just how I am. This just little foibles I have in my character. Just little little picadillos, if you will, that are just, you know, God doesn't, God doesn't mind and God, God doesn't care about those things. Well, we're going to look at today, the reality is this, is these little attitude qualities we have. These little things that we could easily sit back and say, oh, these things that are going on in our lives, they're not a big deal. Well, they are. Because here is a here is an eternal truth you can write down, and and I would challenge you to write this down and think about it. And that is that your attitude impacts your spiritual growth. You realize that? If you're going to grow spiritually, 
in your life, your attitude is key for that happening. Uh, you know, you think about different areas of life, physical, social, uh, emotional, psychological, uh, all of these areas, we should be wanting to grow it. We should be wanting to be uh, socially growing, developing our friendships and our capabilities of having deep and lasting friendships in our lives. We should grow and want to grow psychologically, be people that are deeper, be people of better understanding of what makes us tick and why we tick the way we do. We should want to, hopefully, all of us have the attitude of we want to be physically better and stronger and healthier today than we were yesterday. And we want to grow in our area, in those areas, even uh, in the future as we grow older. Well, also our spiritual lives. We should be saying, I want to grow spiritually. Well, the reality is this. Your attitude impacts your spiritual growth. And it's like a, it's a circle here because the reality is your spiritual growth also affects your attitude. Right? So your attitude affects your spiritual growth. Your spiritual growth affects your attitude. And it's easy for some of us now, I realize, as I'm teaching this, whether you're in this room or you're online watching, to tune me out. And be like, ah, this is a boring sermon. You know, put it, put some chains on, Tony. Preach, shout, shout a little bit. Do something like you did two weeks ago to, to really capture my attention. Because this is, I don't need to hear this anymore. Well, yeah, this is important because here's the reality. The reality is the lost world, people that are far from God, people who have said no to King Jesus, if they recognize that you said yes, if you've declared that you said yes to King Jesus, he has a place in your life. He has a place in your world. You are, you are doing things diligently, like coming to church on a regular basis, reading your Bible, taking time to pray. If you're saying, hey, these things are important to me, know that there are family members that are watching you. There are friends watching you. There are co-workers watching you. There are people that are in your life that are watching you. And it would be very easy for you to brush that off and say, well, if they're watching me, so fine, whatever, I don't care. Well, yeah, you should care because some of these people I'm talking about are important to you, right? Some of these people are, are so close to you and you desire, you want, you long for them to come to know the same things that you know about King Jesus. That you want them to have the same place in their life that you have in your life for Jesus and for the things of God. Know that those people are watching you and they are watching to see if your faith actually makes a real difference in your world and in your life, and in your responses. And yes, yes, they are watching that if you constantly are, uh, are sharing and showing yourself to have a new fear in your life, where you're just, you're catatonic, you're just frozen, you can't move because you're so scared. You know what? That speaks volumes about who you put your trust in. If they find, if, they, if these folks see you living joylessly and you're sour all the time and you're negative and you just always are, the glass is half empty and it's just ugly, ugly, ugly and it's all you're giving to people, those folks are going to be looking at you going, man, if that's how a Christ follower is, no thank you, I don't need that in my life. If these people, these friends of yours, these family members, they're watching, if you are full of anger where it just takes it just takes the wrong red light to set you off. Or it just takes the wrong look from a spouse or a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister to set you off. And if you're so angry in life, that speaks volumes about how Christ is working in your life. If you're ruled with impatience to a point that you're, you're faithless, you know, that speaks volumes. And yes, that impacts how people receive Christ. That impacts people answering the question, well, does, does faith actually make a, a real deal or a real difference in this person's life, right? Uh, if it's not working for you, then why would it work for them, would be their thinking. So, what we've been looking at in Philippians is we've been camping out here for a few weeks now. Paul is really answering that we are to be living the gospel. How do we live the gospel? If the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came on earth, He was the Son of God, He lived a perfect life, He died on a cross for our sins, He was buried physically in the ground in a cave, Three days later, he comes out of that tomb, resurrected with the power of God in his body, in his life. If, if that story 
it makes a difference for us as far as our eternal destination. Uh, Paul makes the statement that this gospel also makes a difference for our day-to-day -day living, for our day-to-day -day life, how we conduct ourselves. Last week, uh, Pastor Dave was speaking, and he talked about how uh, Paul's message, Paul's story for us, his reminder was for us to be actively putting on the mind of Christ, allowing and figuring out what, what, what it was that Christ lived, how he thought, what he did, how his attitudes were, and to begin just step by step putting those into our lives, putting those thoughts, those qualities into our lives as well. Today, uh, Paul is now adding to that story a very practical thing. The, the question, how, what, what should we be living like in light of how Jesus came, died, rose from the dead? In light of Jesus making an impact in our life, what difference should that make for us today? We start with verse 14. Verse 14 says this of chapter 2 in Philippians. Do everything without what? Grumbling or arguing? Some translations might say complaining. Do everything without grumbling or complaining. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Let me tell you, there was a time in my life where I was an arguer, even more so than I am today. Oh, I'm mild, man. I'm tame compared to what I was in my 20s. If you think now, man, that Tony, he, he can argue the best of them. Well, you should have saw what I was like 20 years ago, friend. Uh, I was like an untamed stallion, okay? Uh, uh, arguer, like crazy, complainer, right? You, you know, uh, and I think the turners come by it naturally. I can talk to family members. I won't give you names to protect the, to you know, protect not the not the innocent but the guilty to protect the guilty. Uh, but I can talk to some of my family members, and it can be the most beautiful day in St. Louis, Missouri. It can be 70 degrees in August. No joke. We're experiencing that right now. The humidity could be a nice, calm 15%. And I could be like, hey, how, how's the weather? How, 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 how are things going? Man, it is too windy here. And I'm like, really? You're complaining about the wind when you're living in paradise right now. You know, I'm like, like come on. You know, uh, you know, days, it's too rainy. And then when, when then there's other days when well, it's not, you know, it sure is dry. Boy, we need some rain now. And then as soon as the rain comes, it's too rainy. You know, I just come from this... This, my family, we're complainers. Just by, just naturally, we come by it. So, so during that section, uh, I came across this verse. During that time of my life, when I was at my worst, I I looked at this passage and I was troubled by it, as you could imagine. You know, because clearly Paul here is saying, "Do everything without grumbling or arguing." So, you know what I did? I like with like the best of the pastors, with the best language skills that I could, you know, summit the best language skills that I could gather. I did a deep dive on this verse, and I looked at the Koine Greek, and I looked at you know, the past participles, and I was looking at the, how, the, how the verbs were conjugated as, okay, this is past perfect, this is a past perfect participle. What does that mean exactly? You know, I was looking for some kind of out here where Paul would be saying, if he looked into the deep language and the deep meaning of this verse, this is saying, you know, if everything's going perfectly, this is the translation I was really hoping to gather. If everything's going perfectly and everything's going your way and the weather's great and your family's treating you well and your workplace loves you, then live your life in such a way that you are not complaining or arguing. But if one of those things isn't happening, then it's okay to complain. It's okay to argue. Guess what I found out as I was doing this deep language study, hoping to find that, that meaning behind the Koine Greek. I found that Paul did not mean any of those things that I said. And literally in the original language, verse 14, you know what it says? Do everything without grumbling or complaining. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Paul's not mincing words here. He's not saying to some people, hey, you had life kind of rough. And, you know, if anyone should complain, it should be you, so go ahead. No, he didn't say that. He said, hey, church, do everything without grumbling or complaining. Don't grumble. Don't complain in life. Don't argue with people around you needlessly. Now, it would be easy for us to sit back and say, of all the sins out there, 
The, the seven deadly sins that Dante wrote about and Brad Pitt made famous in that movie in the 90s called Seven. One of the darkest movies I ever saw Brad Pitt make in my life. You know, of all of those sins, are you telling me that drunkenness and, and murder, are you, you're telling me if, as long as I stay away from those things, can't I just go ahead and complain? Can I complain? Because it kind of makes me feel better. It kind of empowers me. Can, can I? Okay, hey, Tony, I'm not killing anybody. I'm not deceiving people. I'm not stealing from them. I'm not hurting them. But, but just because that person, when I see them, they really torque me the wrong way. And I just want to lay into them every once in a while and tell them how wrong I think they are and how dumb I think they are. Can't I argue with those people and do so in good conscience and good faith? And to you, I just simply hand out the scripture and say, Look at what Paul says. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Do, do everything. Why? Why is this? Why, why, Paul? Why should I be living a life where I'm getting worried and getting worked up about how much I complain in my life? Well, he continues on. Verse 14, do everything, do everything without grumbling or complaining. Verse 15, so that you may become what? Blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. First of all, I just need to pause for a second and just tell you, I, when I was reading this passage a couple of weeks ago, pre preparing for today, I just found myself laughing I, I, I literally was like, God, you are so funny. You are funny. Only God, only God. Fast rewind to August, or I mean, I'm sorry, to, to, uh, to March. And, and all the COVID stuff is starting to come. And you remember those first few weeks? I mean, it was coming fast, right? We get some piece of news to go, wow, life's going to change. And, you know, it's going to change in the next month or so. So be prepared. And, and literally... Moments later, we get another piece of news going, no, that change is going to happen actually tomorrow morning, right? Remember those days of just how fast we were going? And, and, you know, we were hearing stories where, I don't know about you, but at times I was kind of like, man, are we headed to like a new black plague? You know, are we going to be experiencing what like our great-great-grandparents experienced with the 1918 pandemic, the, 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 the flu, you know, that they had to deal with in the, the eight, 18, 19, and 20 of the turn of the century. I, I mean, you know, those were the thoughts going on. And so one night, uh, I just separated myself, uh, preparing, preparing for this. And I, I just, I sat in the living room and, uh, and I found myself praying. I found myself reading scripture. I found myself going to pastors, national pastors who I respect and reading some of their thoughts and some of their insights and and listening to some of their talks as they were sharing with other pastors, as they were sharing with their churches about precautions and about things that they were doing. You know, I was just, just gleaning all this stuff to just try to figure out how to prepare us, how to prepare my heart and my family, and how to prepare our church. And, and through that process, without reading, I, and honestly, I, I did not come to this scripture, but through that process, I just kept on hearing a whisper from God in my ear, just every time I pray and say something to God, I hear Him say something back to me. Uh, every time I read a scripture, I just heard this phrase back to me. Every every sermon or every insight I got from a uh, another pastor, I just heard this come back to me. And that was the statement that we try to use. I try to use it often through this season, especially early on. I was using this every time I had an ability to speak into someone's life. And, and that statement was this, I, was a reminder of the opportunity we had in the midst of this dark time. And, and I would say, the church, the church will shine like the stars in the sky. Ellipsis, for you that have not been classically educated, ellipsis is dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. You, you will shine like a star in the sky. And I just started laughing because I was like, God, you put that in my heart back in March. And here we are now in August. And you're reminding me by having us preach on this very verse 
that you want to shine? Do we want to shine among this warped and crooked generation like a star in the sky? Do, do we want to do that? You know, I changed the phrase. If you notice, I've changed it over, over the months because I initially started, with, the church will shine like the stars in the sky. Ellipsis. You will shine like a star in the sky. And I started recognizing that, you know, just honestly, some of the people I was connecting with, some of the people at Northbridge Church, they were not shining like stars in the sky. So I was lying. When I would say, you're going to shine like a star in the sky, that is a lie. Because what reality has to, what in reality has to happen is you have to choose. You have to make this choice for yourself, right? So then I started saying that in a season like this, the church will shine like the stars in the sky. Ellipsis, you can shine like a star in the sky too. You can. If you choose to follow Christ through this scenario, if you choose... To honor Christ in this scenario, you will shine like a star in the sky. What is Paul saying here? He's saying, hey, you want to shine like a star in the sky? Here's the amazing thing. This is beautiful. This is so beautiful because we would naturally think to shine like a star in the sky, we're going to have to do something incredible, aren't we? Like, we're going to have to give all of our money away. Every penny that you've saved all your life, you're going to have to give that to orphanages and to non-government organizations and to churches and to mission entities. In order for you to, do, to shine like a star in the sky, you've got to do something great, something incredible. You've got to sacrifice your body to the flames, right? You gotta, if you're going to shine like a star in the sky, you've got to surrender your job. You've got to quit your job right now. You've got to say, okay, I'm going to commit to go and serve uh, foreign people in another country. Now, that, now I'll shine like a star in the sky. Oh, no, no, okay, okay, some kind of great action, you see? Paul is saying, in order for you to shine like a star in the sky, in order for you to be blameless, in order for you to be pure, what do you do? Some kind of great, crazy act of sacrifice that, like, let's face it, 95% of us just can't or won't do? No, Paul didn't say that. He said, if you want to shine like a star in the sky, quit complaining. Be a person that when, they, when other people experience you, you're not complaining. Quit arguing with people all the time. Why are you arguing? Just, just to prove that you're right? Paul said, look, you want to be a person that shines, that, that stands out from the world around them? You don't, you don't have to go and serve five years in the Peace Corps to be great. You don't have to, to, to turn over a year's salary to some nonprofit. You don't have to march in the streets and proclaim some kind of truth out there, but just be a person in which you are not complaining and you're not arguing with people around you. And then what does Paul say? By doing that, you're going to be blameless. You're going to be pure in your life. This is so practical. Not a, we don't have to do this series of complex rituals to be blameless, to be pure. Blameless. What is blameless? It means to be without blame, right? To be without blame. Now, it would be easy for us just to walk past that term and just not think about it. But think of people who have deep amount, a deep amount of blame within their life. You know those folks. They're the kind of people that, that just, have, just have blame upon blame upon blame heaped on them by the way they choose to live. That's the kind of person that when you see them coming, you walk the other way, right? Because you don't want to be around them. But because they have just so much blame on their lives, they're just they're negative. There I use the word, they're just bad, right? They're... You, you, they, they're just, they just got so much bad. They're the kind of people I'm talking about that, you know, when they were kids, when they get punished, and you found out, they found, you know, that somehow it was found out that they were punished unjustly, that everyone said, well, it's okay because of the ten things that they got away with, right? That's, that's what I'm talking about. Paul said, you don't want to be that kind of person, you want to be blameless, then stop complaining. Stop arguing. You want to be looked at in this world as a person who is pure, has this deep purity in their life, Paul is telling us the secret is to live life, live, if you want to live without stain, without defect, that's what the definition of purity is, then, then don't be a person that complains all the time. 
Don't be a person who argues. Isn't it so funny? Because when we, when we as Christians, when we're setting out to be blameless, when we're setting out for purity, we think we have to have this deep religious austerity, right? We've got to memorize at least ten verses of the Bible every day for the next ten years so that when someone talks to us, we just quote a scripture verse naturally. And we think, oh, that's going to make us pure. No, it's not. I mean, it's a good practice, and I'm not telling you not to memorize verses. I memorize the Bible. It's helpful. It's a helpful exercise to do. But that exercise by itself will not make me blameless. It will not make me pure. We could do great efforts. Like I could say, I could make the intention of every day of my life, I'm going to share Christ with someone every day. Again, a great that's a great goal to have. And that's something I would challenge us. We as a church have to be more intentional about sharing our faith. But I know people who are very intentional in sharing their faith, and yet they still deal with the same impurity and blame that, that everyone else does. That, that kind of exercise will not help them be blameless or pure. But here we have it in black and white. The scripture set out, simple as can be. You want to experience blamelessness in your life? When people look at you, they see just a pure life in a crooked and broken and dark world. Then be a person who's not complaining. Be a person who's not looking to get into arguments all the time. Now, you know, I find that this area of, of our walk, this area of life, is just like any other muscle. If you've never used those muscles, then it's pretty hard. And someone who always comes at life complaining, arguing, blaming people, uh, being negative, and I just say, hey, you know what, would you just, would you start being positive? That's hard to do. Downright impossible, right? Because, because it's a muscle you're not used to using. So how does one go about getting to a place where they're not arguing and they're not complaining in life? Well, Paul gives us a hint here in verse 17. He says, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. What is Paul saying here? Paul's reminding them, hey, I have chains on. Hey, I'm going to die in the next few months, weeks, maybe days. I don't know how much longer I have on this earth. And yet I am glad and I rejoice in you and your faith. And so now I'm challenging you. This is what Paul's saying here literally to the people. So if I can be glad and rejoice, you too be glad and rejoice with me. Let's do this. So what's, Paul, what's Paul's solution uh, in avoidance of how to stop complaining and how to stop arguing? Be glad. Find things to be glad about. And rejoice often. In other words, choose gladness in your life. Every day. If you find yourself being a person that's prone to complain, prone to argue with people, every day when you wake up, Think of something that you can rejoice with God in. Think of something you can be glad about in life. Maybe it's as simple as, you know what? I woke up today and I'm, and I, I, I am, I am vertical instead of horizontal. I am up on my feet instead of in a grave somewhere. I will rejoice in the fact that I have life for another day. And every time you find yourself going down the road of complaining, every time you find yourself going down the road where you're about to get in an argument with a friend or a family member, just stop. You know that you're starting to head that way. Stop and take time to rejoice. And say, you know what, God? I am so thankful. I am so thankful that, that I'm alive today. If I have nothing else to be thankful for, I'm thankful for living. I'm thankful for my life, God. Find something to be thankful for. Maybe for some of us, we need to write it down so we can look at it and see it. And recall it often. If You have to write it down and put it in your cubicle or put it in your car or put it in a mirror. Put it wherever you're going to go often throughout that day so you could be reminded of it. Here's what I would challenge many of us to do. And further... For, for the record, this information is on our, on our electronic bulletin. So before you go out 
uh, go to the QR code, scan it, and you'll have these questions in front of you. What I would challenge you to do this week is to go to someone who you trust. Maybe a family member, maybe a wife or a husband, maybe a co-worker, maybe someone in your small group who you trust. Take some time to sit out with them, can even be over the phone, and just say, you know, would you just sit with me and help me analyze my complaining habits? And, and part of this is going to be you talking, but part of this is honestly you allowing this person who you trust to talk and speak into your life. Analyze your complaining habits. And here's the things, during the analysis, these are the things, that, and this, these are listed in the bulletin, but these would be the things that you would be analyzing, you'd be asking yourself about, and you'd be talking to your friend or family member about. What, first question is just, what do you complain about? What, what, what is it that you just find yourself, are there, are there some common denominators here? Or is it everything? You just complain about everything, right? What are the things that you tend to complain about in your life? Second question is, who do you typically complain to? Maybe you complain to everyone listening, right? Anyone that's coming into your path. You need to ask, man, how am I representing myself to those folks? Or, or maybe it's just one person who you trust. You know, when I said this in the first hour, and, and I believe it truly, if you find yourself saying, yeah, you know, I don't come, I'm always positive to everyone, but this one person I just unload on, then I would say you need to this week go to that one person and apologize to them and say, you know what, I'm sorry because every time I'm around you, I find myself so negative and I find myself complaining all the time, and I do it because I trust you, but here's the reality, friend. When you're, yeah, you're doing it because you trust that person, but you know what you're doing at that point? You're like a, a you're like an emotional vampire. You latch onto their neck emotionally with your teeth, and you're sucking their life out because when someone's hearing you complain all the time, you're taking energy from them, believe it or not. And so it might be that if you're consistently doing it to one person all the time, you need to go to that person and say, I am sorry. Because the reality is you do it enough, that one person might be looking for an escape hatch whenever they see you coming, right? They're, they're trying to grab a parachute and jump out to get away. So, so you might need to apologize if you find yourself complaining to one individual all the time. Another question to help you in your analysis is, where do you complain at? You know, Do you find yourself that in this area, at your home, you're safe to complain? In the break room, you're complaining. Uh, in the car, you're complaining. Uh, you know, just helps you, uh, helps you understand, you know, how deep these tentacles go in your life. And then a question for you to ask yourself, but you'd also ask the person who's talking to you, the person who is responding to you, is simply the question, how has this impacted me? How has this impacted me? You know, that'd be a real, if you've got a person who's a truth teller in your life, who, who, you know, you've created an environment where you're saying, look, share with me, help me. Your silence will not help me here. And you got someone who will speak to you honestly with love and grace, at, but at the same point still telling the truth. Man, this could be really interesting of how your complaints, you being argumentative all the time, how that has eroded who you are. How that has eroded how, what God has made you to be. You realize every person, every person on planet Earth has been uniquely and fearfully made by God. But we have a habit through our sin life, through our choices, to erode that just beautiful person that God made. And yeah, in American churches, we've done a great job pointing out those sins like, like drunkenness and pointing out to people who live in homeless shelters and living on the street and showing how their life has been degraded. Yeah, we as a church, we've done a great job looking at sexual sins and pointing out sexual sins and saying, look how this degrades people. Look how it degrades human existence. But you know, there are some sins that we deal with in the church and we find ourselves, and I'm guilty too, as pastors, we just kind of stay mum on, right? And we kind of just say, let's not talk about that. The truth being is the reason we don't talk about it is because they often affect us just as much as they do those people out there, right? Those sinners out on the streets. And the reality is this, friend, I'll tell you right now, a complaining argument of heart is just as toxic as a heart that is filled and wanting with, with uh, drunkenness or lechery or any other great sin that we're very quick to point our finger at and, and do this and tisk, 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 
the whole time, right? The reality is complaining and, argue, and having an argument of spirit is just as toxic to your life as a, as a fifth of Jack Daniels is, friend. Huh. The idea of complaining and an argument is just as hurtful to your soul and your ability to connect with people as having one night stands and, and a series of hookups with people. We think that that doesn't hurt us or impact us, and yet it does. I would argue with you that having an having argumentative spirit and having a, having a spirit in which you complain, a serial complainer, will degrade you and will steal your joy and it hurts your witness and it diminishes your capacity for joy. It diminishes your capacity to be the kind of man, the kind of woman that God made you to be just as great as any other sin that we're very quick to point out in life. So let's, let's look and let's get honest with how this, this hurtful spirit of argue, arguing and complaining, how it impacts us and how it impacts the church as well. How it impacts your potential ministry that God has placed in front of you. And then a final question I would challenge every person to ask their friend, their family members, not just how has this impacted me, but, but what can I rejoice about in life? And you finish that time sitting down with them saying, think, help me think, um, help me create maybe a list of two or three things that are my go-tos of things that I can rejoice in, things that I can lean into, things that, that I know are things that whenever I start going down this road of complaining, and arguing with people around me, I can stop and I can redirect my mind and say, God, I'm not going to complain about this thing that really has torn me off, but instead I'm going to rejoice in what you've given me in the fact that I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, in the fact that I know that I'm a child of yours, in the fact that I know that you have great things in store for me, if not in this life, in the world to come. I have things right now that I can rejoice in. And I choose to think of those. And I choose to brag on those in my life. Perhaps that would be a good conversation for us to have this week with someone we trust, with someone we love. What we're going to do now is we're going to close in prayer and we're just going to begin practicing the discipline of rejoicing. And what I'm going to do, and hear me clearly so that you aren't wondering why I'm being silent, I'm going to open us in prayer and I'm going to rejoice in it for a moment or two in things that's going on in my life that I'm so thankful for. Um, and then I'm just going to be silent. And during that silence, I invite you to think about what it is that you rejoice in right now, that you are thankful for. And you can do that silently, and God hears you. Uh, and that's fine. Do that. If that's how you feel comfortable, do that. I would also invite some of you to, to maybe vocalize and verbalize some things that you rejoice in, because you know what it does? It encourages us. It encourages the body of Christ. And so if you are so compelled, you can just very shortly, just quiet, or just, just I don't know, for, for, for us to hear you, just say, God, I rejoice right now in this. You know, it's as simple as that. It's a five-second prayer. So with that in mind, let's conclude our time together by praying. Pray with me. Father, right now we come before you and I just ask God that you would help us to be people who rejoice. You would help us to be people who are not complainers, not arguers, but instead we follow your path by finding the good and reveling in it. And God, right now in my life, I revel in the fact that I have a great wife and I have a great son Thank you for placing Dana and Dax in my life. No matter what happens, God, to be with them at this time has been such a great blessing. And God, as people, no doubt, have been quietly just whispering to you in these moments, 
Would you hear the rejoicing in our hearts and experience that? Oh God, use these as just practical tools to make us people who are blameless, people who are pure, so that, so that it makes an impact in us and it impacts people around us. Lord, hear the, the praises of Your people as we sing this last song together. In Jesus' strong and powerful name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet and join the band in this song.
control Consume me from the inside out Lord, let justice and praise Be known my embrace To love you from the inside out Everlasting, your life will shine And all the faith you ending Your glory goes beyond all faith And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise From the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out for me experienced an incredible God today. Mm, yeah. Hey, let uh, this team and let Pastor Tony uh, know you appreciate them and leading us today. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I'll be honest, I felt like Tony was kind of picking a scab with me today. I mean, because sometimes I feel like I'm kind of justified in my complaining and kind of <laughs> justified in my arguing. So instead of going home and complaining to Tammy about what Tony said to me, all right, I'm just going to go home. I'm going to go home and I'm going to meditate on these <laughs> scriptures this week because it is, it is so true. Uh, what God's Word says to us. And so I pray that you would do the same thing this week, that you would allow God's Spirit and His Word just to move uh, in your lives this week. And don't forget uh, to uh, scan the QR code on the way out. There's one over there by the Giving Center. There's one uh, in the in the cafe area so to get your announcements and so forth. If you're not, if you're not sure kind of how to use that, just wait for somebody who's over there that's doing it, and they can show you how to do that. And if, if you don't want to do that, there is actually a hard copy of the announcements and those questions taped to uh, the window out in the cafe area. So uh, that is where you can get those announcements and those questions that Pastor Tony was talking about earlier. God bless. Would you just allow God to continue to move and work in your lives this week as you go from here? You're dismissed. Who was that, Hannah? Ouch.